We are in the book of Jonah still. And uh, we're gonna actually going to get through a whole chapter tonight. Huh? Huh? That's going to be crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy. All right, so we're going to go to chapter 2. That's where we're going to be at tonight. Is in chapter 2. Um, I, uh, I, was, I had to do a funeral this last week for a set of twins that were born and passed away. And I just, uh, you saw God's presence there. I mean, in the midst of the grief, there was a huge amount of hope that was uh, taking place. And uh, the family that we helped out through that, um, you know, they, they didn't want anybody else to be involved in that besides us because the young man had been with us for a couple years, developed a relationship with us, and then he got involved. You know, he is doing his own thing or whatever, but this is what he knew. And uh, we were able to minister to their whole family and extended family and all of that. And so thank you for your prayers this last week for that. God was uh, very faithful. Very faithful. Okay, so here we are. We got this guy named Jonah. Okay. This guy, you know, he's a prophet. God told him to go talk to the Ninevites. He refused. He's like, there ain't no way I'm going to talk to those pagans, so I'm going to run from God. So he decides to run in the form of a ship on the high seas. He thinks that he's getting away from God, but he really is not. God's created this huge storm, and uh, the sailors wake him up, ask him, what should we do? Jonah finally confesses, it's my fault that this is happening the only way you're going to solve this is by throwing me overboard. That's the only way how this is going to get solved. And so they finally decide uh, the last resort. They pick up Jonah. They throw him into the sea. Immediately it becomes calm outside. And then a God directs a fish, whatever kind of fish it was. Some people say it's like a whale or something. I think it was a huge grouper. You know, you know, or, you know, those things, those things will eat anything, right? They're huge fish, and they'll eat garbage cans and, I mean, just lots of stuff. So, um, but anyway, a big fish swallows Jonah, and he's in the fish's stomach for three days. This is where we're going to pick this up, all right? In fact, what we're going to be reading, as I was getting ready for this, a majority of commentators believe that what we're going to be reading tonight in chapter 2 is the message of the whole Bible. Like it's the whole Bible condensed into this prayer that Jonah's going to pray to God. All right, so we're going to start in Jonah chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And I'm just going to read through the 10 verses. There's only 10 verses. This is his prayer. Let's start in verse 1. It says, then Jonah prayed, okay? He's in the belly of the whale or the fish, the grouper, whatever. And he's, three days have gone by. And it says, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from inside the fish. Don't you, wouldn't it be awesome just to have been there to like hear it? I mean, you know, I know, what would you hear? I don't know, what would you hear? I don't know. But anyway, there he is inside this fish, right? And he starts to pray. Verse 2 says, he said, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead, and Lord, you heard me. You threw me into the ocean depths, and I sank down to the heart of the sea. The mighty waters engulfed me. I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves. Then I said, O oh Lord, you have driven me from your presence, yet I will look once more towards your holy temple. I sank beneath the waves, and the waters closed over me. Seaweed wrapped itself around my head. Verse 6, I sank down to the very roots of the mountains. I was imprisoned in the earth, whose gates locked shut forever. 
But you, O Lord, snatched me from the jaws of death. As my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord, and my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. Those who worship false gods turn their backs on all God's mercies. But I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise. I will fulfill all my vows, for my salvation comes from the Lord alone. Then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out onto the beach. Okay, so up to this point, Jonah is running from God. All right, he's running from God. Not just physically running from God, but emotionally and spiritually running from God. Have you ever emotionally and spiritually ran from God before? I have, right? I mean, I might not be physically running from God, but I know that I'm doing it emotionally. I'm, I'm, I'm setting up some walls between me and God, and I'm running from him spiritually because I know he's trying to do some stuff at the core of my being, and I don't like it, right? So Jonah is doing that. Jonah is a very religious guy um, that, who knows a lot about God, but he doesn't know God. He knows a lot about God, but he doesn't know God. That's one of my concerns, especially in our country, is that there are people, they know a lot about God, but they don't know God. They, it's all right here. Like they have all this head knowledge about God, or they think they have all this head knowledge about God, right? But the problem is, is they haven't let it sink from here 18 inches down to their hearts. You know, they don't really know God. He's learned um, about... Um, He's, Jonah's about to learn about one of the most important attributes about God. And it has to do with his grace. His grace. In fact, God's grace is what caused Jonah to put up a wall. That's what caused him to put up a wall. Because Jonah, he knew about God. I think he was afraid. I really think Jonah was afraid. If I go to the Ninevites and I warn them, they could, they could repent and then God will forgive them. I don't think I can handle that. So he decides to run, right? In fact, a lot of scholars believe that this interaction between God and Jonah are the core truths that we need to embrace if we're going to really understand God's grace. And if it's really going to make a difference in our lives. All right, so what it took for Jonah, though, like look at what it took for Jonah to get to that point. Oftentimes, that's what it takes for us. I mean, I don't know how worse it could get for Jonah. Right? He was in a storm. He thought he was going to drown. Now he's in the gut of a fish who's swimming who knows how many miles down under the ocean. I don't think he can get any worse. And so from Jonah's standpoint, I think he thinks, this is it. I'm done. I'm not getting out of here, right? And so this storm was the result of his own rebellion. Now all of us here... We've experienced storms caused by our own rebellion. Right? Here's some encouragement about this. It's in the midst of Jonah's rebellion and this storm that he's going to understand God's grace. All right? He's going to understand it fully. And because there's tons of stories throughout the Bible of people who experienced epic failure and God met them in the midst of their epic failure, and they learned something about God's grace in a way that they have never experienced before. In fact, there's numerous stories of people in history that experienced new, uh, epic failure, 
before they actually stepped into what God had created them to do, okay? I want to read this thing to you, okay? Um, do you guys know who J.K. Rowling is? Who's that? She's the writer of Harry Potter. That's right. She's the author of the Harry Potter books, all right? Yep, so she gave a commencement speech once at this one at, at Harvard, okay? I want you to listen to what she said. In fact... Um, J.K. Rowling, she's worth billions of dollars right now. Billions. All right. Listen to this. It says, J.K. Rowling's Harvard commencement speech in 2008. Listen to this. She described a point in her life in which she had failed on an epic scale. An exceptionally short-lived marriage had imploded. I was jobless a lone parent, and as poor as it, as it is possible to be in modern Britain without being homeless. But, she added, I began to direct all my energy into finishing the only work that mattered to me. Had I really succeeded at anything else, I might never have found the determination to, dis to succeed in one arena, writing, I believe I truly, where I truly belonged. In short, she said, her success was built on her failure. Her success was built on her failure. So, Jonah's journey, okay? I want you to think about this. Jonah's journey was a series of going down. God told him to go down to see Nineveh. He got on the ship. He went down into the hold of the ship. He got thrown into the sea. And now he's going down into the depths of the ocean. Okay, so his journey is down, 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 down. Okay, that's where his journey is right now. And in fact, in fact, um, when he says in verse 3, he says, I went down to the ocean's depths. So that's where he is, okay? This is a truth that you need to understand about experiencing God's grace. And it's this, sometimes lying at the bottom looking up is the only way to truly understand and experience God's grace. Sometimes when you are all the way down and you have no place to, to look but up that's the point right there that you're going to understand and experience God's grace because you have nowhere else to go and nowhere else to look that's where Jonah is that's where we've been right so Jonah knew about God's grace okay listen you need to understand this he knew about God's grace but he didn't understand it, and he didn't embrace it. Because, see, you can go to church. I don't care how long you go to church. You can go to church, and you can hear it from the pastor's mouth as he talks about God's grace. And it can go all in here, and it goes all right here, and you're hearing about his God's grace. But the problem is, if you don't fully understand it on how God's grace, how that, how, how that can affect your life, how that can change your life, and if you don't fully embrace God's grace in your life, it's not going to make a hill of beans a difference in your life. And for Jonah, Jonah was a paid professional God-man. Okay? That was his job. He was like being paid to represent God and teach people about God. He didn't understand God's grace, nor did he embrace it. All right? So this whole thing, as far as what happened with Jonah, this is about Jonah experiencing something at the core that has been missing in his relationship with God. Maybe it's been missing in your relationship with God. Right? Because... You don't fully understand it. Okay, so it's when he's at the bottom, 
that Jonah decides to look up and he begins to pray. Okay, oh yeah, here as a side note, here's really important, okay? When you're at the bottom, okay, if you don't have any kind of conversation with God, like you get to the bottom and you're not having a conversation with God, you're in deep trouble. Because there's no hope. And so for Jonah, remember, he was in the, this is the third day. He's had three days soaked in bile scum and, you know, wrapped in seaweed and other fish and whatever else was eaten. And there he was, day three. He doesn't pray day one. He prays day three. So it took three days for him finally to come to this point and look up. And he prays. And finally, when Jonah is at the end of himself, he's willing to have an honest conversation with God about who he is, what he's done, why he's powerless to rescue himself, and why God is the only rescuer. Do you know what that's called? That's called the gospel. That is the gospel. When you admit what you've done, when you know you can't rescue yourself, and when you finally come to the point where you say, God has to be my rescuer, that's the gospel. And Jonah's about ready to experience that physically. Okay? So, in order to fully understand God's grace, that's why this is so important, there's some key truths that we have to grasp. And not everyone, okay, I need, I, you also need to understand, especially in our culture, not everyone thinks that we need God's grace. Because we live in a culture of self-correction, don't we? Right? Um, I want to read this to you about this. this is a, there's a book that was written a while ago. Um, great book. It's called Knowing God by J.I. Packard. Okay, great, great book. It's an old book. But it's a great book, right? I want you to listen to what he said. This is a while ago, but this is so true today. Listen to this. He goes, um, Packard, he calls this our moral ill desert that we have to come to grips with, okay? Um, he says, this is a hard message for our culture to hear. We live in an age marked by the triumph, he says, of the therapeutic. Okay, he says this, we are taught that our problem is a lack of self-esteem, that we live with too much shame and self-incrimination. In addition, we are told all moral standards are socially constructive and relative, so no one has the right to make you feel guilty. You must determine right or wrong for yourself. In a society dominated by such beliefs, the Bible's persistent message that we are guilty sinners comes across as oppressive, if not evil and dangerous. These modern cultural themes make the offer of grace unnecessary and at times even an insult. Okay? So for Jonah, okay, for Jonah, he's coming to grips with a very real truth. Okay? Okay? Because you got to remember, Jonah was a prophet. Jonah was a man of God. Right? He's coming face to face with his sin. Right? Face to face with his sin. And so in verse 3, Jonah admits that God put him where he is because of his sinful rebellion against God. All right? So here's, here's the first truth about grace that we have got to understand. Because if you don't understand this, grace means nothing. And it's this, okay? I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I am a sinner in need of a Savior. I am a sinner in need of a Savior. In fact, in verse 6, I'm just going to read that again. Listen to what he says. He says, he says, I sank down to the very roots of the mountains. I was imprisoned in the earth 
whose gates lock shut forever, but you, O Lord, my God, snatched me from the jaws of death. So at this point, okay, so at this point, Jonah admits, finally, he finally admits he's in a prison that he cannot get out of. It doesn't matter how good he is. It doesn't matter how he talks. It doesn't matter if he can manipulate something. It doesn't matter if he can trick somebody about something, pay somebody off. It, it doesn't matter. He's like, I'm in a prison. I have no way to get out. None whatsoever. There's no scheming, no bribery, no amount of self-help, no amount of making deals with God, no amount of hiding will save him. And it's like that for us. For us to truly understand God's grace, we need to understand there is no way that we can escape, escape the penalty of our sin. There's no way that we can escape this huge gap that's between us and God. There's no way for us to do that. It doesn't matter how many times you go to church, how many times you go to Bible study. I don't care if you give a million dollars to somebody. If you go and serve somebody, serve in Ethiopia for your whole life. I don't care. It doesn't matter. There is no way that you and I can escape that. There's just no way. And in order, we need to understand that if we're going to fully understand God's grace. So to fully understand it, we need to embrace the second truth, okay? And that is, I cannot save myself. I cannot save myself. You know what's crazy about that? Oh, my gosh. Okay, so some of it, okay, so, so some of us, we understand that when we come to Jesus, like that's kind of what draws us to Jesus. Like we understand that when we come to Jesus, we're like, yeah, you're right. I can't save myself. But then something happens after we put our faith in Jesus, and then we start following Jesus, and then all of a sudden we think that we can save ourselves. No, you can't. Like, Jesus didn't die on the cross to meet us halfway. Like, he does some of it, and then we do the rest. No. That's not the way it is. So Jonah's coming to this conclusion. He's like, oh my, I cannot rescue myself. And so for Jonah, this is a huge shift that's starting to take place inside of Jonah. It doesn't happen all the way because of what we'll find out later on. I mean, this is a hard journey for some of us, isn't it? Right? It is. It's this hard journey that we try to, to come to grips with. And here, okay, so here's the thing for Jonah. This is what Jonah thought. Jonah thought being religious, he thought being religious um, would actually connect him with God's grace. The reality is, do you know that he, him being religious actually caused him to run from God? Think about that. Jonah's decision to be religious is what actually caused him to run from God. Okay. So now, because of God's insane grace and his mercy, right, Jonah is experiencing the reality now, right, of not being able to save himself from the consequences of his disobedience. Okay. We're Jonah. We're Jonah. We not, might not have been swallowed by a fish. But we've gone through our storms, haven't we? You ever have those moments when you've gone down, 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 right? And, the pro and finally, when you get to the bottom, the only place to look is up. And you're like, the, I can't, I, the, you're the one who has to save me. You have to save me. Right? You have to save me. So 
Jonah tells God twice, listen to this, in this prayer, he tells God twice that he's looking towards God's holy temple. He says that twice. Okay, so you need to understand from Jonah's perspective, from Jonah's perspective, he understood there was only one place. There was only one place you could get God's attention. Only one place that that could happen. That was in the Holy of Holies in the temple. And so as Jonah is saying, okay, I look towards your holy temple. I'm looking towards your holy temple. I'm looking, you know what he's doing? He's going back to the fact that in the Holy of Holies, okay, um, how this worked is there was this thing called the mercy seat, okay? And they took the Ark of the Covenant, and on top of the Ark of the Covenant, they put this slab of gold on top of the Ark of the Covenant, all right? And so then what they would do is they would sacrifice animals, and then they would sprinkle the blood on the slab of gold, all right? And that was that representation, right? That representation. They would sprinkle it on there. That was a representation of a picture of them approaching God, broken, flawed, unable to obey his commandments. Oh, yeah, by the way, the Ten Commandments were in the Ark of the Covenant, which nobody was able to keep. I want you to think about that. The Ten Commandments that were in the Ark of the Covenant... Nobody kept those 100% of the time except Jesus. Nobody. Okay, so here it is. Because I want you to get this picture. Ark of the Covenant. Ten Commandments. So the priest would go in there, and he's going to basically confess the sins of the whole nation, right? Because they didn't obey the Ten Commandments, and either, neither did they, right? So they sacrificed this animal, sprinkled the blood on it. That was to cover their sins until the next time when they would do it all over again. Right? They would do it all over again. All right? Here's the truth about God's grace. Because this is what Joan is thinking of. I can only be saved. I can only be saved by an extreme and costly sacrifice. Jonah's thinking about that. I can only be saved by an extreme and costly sacrifice. That's the only way it's going to happen. And Jonah gets that. And so Jonah is coming to grips with these three truths. I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself. The only way I'm going to get saved is through an extreme and costly sacrifice. He's coming to grips with those now. Firsthand, in the middle of this, okay? So now, now guess what? Now it's starting to sink from here down to here. Now it's going 18 inches down here. Now it's connecting with his core, right? His soul. And at the end of his prayer, he says something that in... That summarizes the entire gospel. You got to get this. This is what he says at the end. In fact, this is where a lot of the commentator says, this next verse, this is the message of the whole Bible. You can condense it into this verse right here. And he, say, he says, um, for my salvation comes from the Lord alone. My salvation comes from the Lord alone. That's the gospel. That's the message of the Bible. That's how people get so messed up. Because we want to take it in all these weird directions. And so, in this final statement that Jonah makes, this final statement, Jonah brings home the core truth about God's grace. That's why this is so important you understand this, all right? It's that from God alone that we experience forgiveness and a restored relationship with God. From God alone, not us. That's never, I mean, this whole thing of us not being able to save ourselves, 
That doesn't change once you become a Christ follower. You cannot save yourself. We were talking about this in men's Bible study this morning. This is about a relationship with God. A relationship with God. All right? In fact, it is because of the extreme and costly sacrifice of God's Son that we can have life and a future with God. I'm going to end with this verse in Ephesians chapter 2. Listen to what this says. Starting in verse 8, Paul is writing to the Ephesians. He says this, God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. So stop trying. It is a gift from God. Right? Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. It is God and God alone. For we are God's masterpiece. I'm just going to finish 10. I don't know if it's up there. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Do you understand that God calling you his masterpiece is connected to his grace? Do you get that? You are God's masterpiece because of his grace. That's why you're his masterpiece. Because of his grace. So the whole story about Jonah is about God's insane grace and mercy. And our story is about God's insane grace and mercy, isn't it? That's our story, right? My prayer for us is that we're, gonna, we're willing to fully embrace his grace. That means every day. From the moment you get up to when you go to bed at night, you find ways, find ways to connect with God and his grace throughout the day. You ask him for his grace to be manifested through you all day long. Through every interaction, through every situation, through every obstacle, his grace. Because it's through his grace, that's when we truly connect with God's love, is through his grace. Because that's what it's about. And for Jonah... For Jonah, that's what it took. That extreme thing that took for Jonah to start to experience that. Now, he doesn't get there yet. Because we're going to see there's still some obstacles in his heart. And you know what that tells me? How extreme that can get inside of us. And what God has to do again and again and again to help us reconnect. And he's going to do that because he loves us. And he wants us to experience that. All right? So, all right, those of you that are watching on Facebook, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we love our Facebook family. And um, thank you, Nate. And uh, so uh, make sure that you check out our um, Facebook page. We've got some stuff on there about TNC2 and how we're moving closer with that. And uh, so, but we're going to see you guys. We're going to sign off from Facebook. We'll see you guys next week. But for the rest of us, we're going to stand up and we're going to sing a song together. All right? We're going to end with this, and then I will pray us out of here. All right? So let's sing this.